G'day, welcome to Mark and Sam After Work. Today I want to do a video on one part of internal ballistics or gunpowder. I want to go into some of the differences um, including right back to what used to be called gunpowder, we now call black powder, but into also obviously largely talking about our smokeless powder that we use now. Um, to start off with, um, fairly, uh, most people would know, um, simple situation, we use some form of um, well, we have a, a barrel with a projectile. Behind that we have gunpowder, which is the energy to force the projectile out and to get it going. And then we have some form of igniting it. Um, used to be fuses and things like that. Now we have the likes of a primer. Um, we strike the fire primer with a firing pin that sends a charge off or that sends a fire off, a flame off, um, an explosion off to ignite our gunpowder. Um, that creates pressure that forces the projectile down the barrel. That's the basics of it. Um, then it turns into the complexities of how we get that done. Um, part of getting that done efficiently is about a pressure curve um, and how fast that comes on and how much energy it's got in it to create the expansion or create the pressure to then force that projectile out and how that pressure curve builds to certain points and how the shape of it is very important to the efficiencies of getting the projectile out the end. Um, in the likes of the what we now call, call gun powder, we have what's called smokeless powder. In some parts of the world it's called cordite and some folks would know it as a nitro. Um, nitro is not a bad term for it because our gunpowders are made out of, a smokeless gunpowder is made out of um, nitrocellulose, that's a single base gunpowder. We have in some situations we use a double base powder in our firearms as well, that's nitrocellulose and nitroglycerine. Um, and then there's power, I don't think it's used in the firearms, I think it's not used more in artillery, not really familiar, but triple base powders which are nitrocellulose, nitroglycerine and a nitrogorodine or I'd forgotten the last name, but another nitro. Those are all about that same thing, creating that pressure curve. Um, it's energy, the energy that's in there. And I should say, I'll probably say again, the smokeless gunpowder, the big advantage we got with smokeless gunpowder over black powder, apart from other things, the big advantage was around, or even more than, but around three times the power, three times the potential energy is what the, the nitro powder has, or the smokeless powder has. I think largely made out of animal fats is where, it's, where it comes from, but listen, I'm not a chemist, so I'm going to go into where your nitroglycerins and cellulose and things comes from, but that's, that's an ingredient that's important. Nitro, or your smokeless powders, are used in everything from your level 22 cartridge right up to guns on ships or artillery, where you're using literally tens of kilos in big pellet form of gunpowder to push very large projectiles, but we're, we're all talking in the, in the nitro, cordite, smokeless, whatever you're gonna call it, modern gunpowder, these are the, the places you're gonna find all this stuff. Now that pressure curve which I mentioned is a very important detail because how that pressure comes on and how, it, how much pressure it creates to, is the force that pushes that projectile out. Now we have X amount of energy, but using energy is actually about the shape of that curve, which is really about timing. It's about where the pressure comes on, how fast it comes on, when it comes on, what point it gets to, and then how it dissipates as well. Um, largely the timing we're talking about in the way of people wondering, is it burn all the way down the barrel or things like that? Largely with the likes of nitro gunpowder or smokeless gunpowder, it happens all in half a millisecond. Um, so largely the projectile's only just started moving. Doesn't mean the push has stopped at that point because that will be peak pressure. And then that pressure has built up, that's expansion of gases has built up and that's still gonna force. And then the size of your projectile, your length of your barrel, all that sort of stuff is going to be, you're working out to try and then find efficiencies of where you can use that expansion of gas to push for its longest without suffering friction or all the other issues you come into where you get too long. So there's a balance of using that pressure once it's built up, but there's also, like I said, a balance of how that pressure builds up. Now, the the, the, the ways you can cha change of that curve in the way you can um, use that curve certainly matters. Uh, if you've got something that's heavier and it's going to take more acceleration, you want your pressure curve to build up maybe a little higher, but you want it to build up a little slower so it gets more of a push rather than a punch. 
Um, that's the nature of some of the things in looking at the, the speeds of it. And obviously the pressure it can go to and the strength of the firearm and the, all those things matter as well, or the strength of your chamber. Um, the, the ways they change that, um, there's a little bit in the, the single base, double base, triple base, that change the pressure curve, um, which is the chemical composition of the actual gunpowder. Um, there's a little bit in the size and the shape um, of gunpowder and, and basically how big it is. Um, there's stuff that's got holes in it. There's all sorts of different pieces that have been over the years. Um, there's also another interesting feature that goes with the gunpowder that a lot of people wouldn't realise is they use a retarder. They actually coat the gunpowder with something that's, that slows down that burn. So in some cases you'll have exactly the same core ingredients but it's the retarder on the outside of it which changes the rate it burns at. Now, I would stress that this all still happens. It's more about the pressure curve. Largely that pressure has happened inside half a millisecond, maybe three quarters, but very, very, very fast. Very super fast as that actually happened, but still affects things and how it actually pushes things, the pressure it builds up, when it's peak pressures and that sort of stuff. And very important to follow what the manufacturer is suggesting that's used for, where it suits and where it doesn't suit. But that's what it's about. Um, An important ingredient to understand with nitro gunpowders or smokeless gunpowders is that even though it seems like an explosion because it's, at, it's an explosive force and an explosive timing and all that sort of stuff, it isn't actually an explosion. Smokeless gunpowder burns. It turns that solid fuel into a superheated gas, which creates a lot of pressure, um, heat and pressure. And that's how it propagates through the cartridge. It creates heat and pressure and heat and pressure and heat and pressure. The, the two things create each other. The heat and pressure is what it builds and burns so quickly and creates so much energy from is heat and pressure. I say that because now we'll swap over to, smoke, to black powder, or in the 1800s, what you would have called gunpowder. Um, it um, is out of charcoal, saltpeter, and sulfur, or I think that's carbon, um, potassium nitrate, and sulfur. It comes from the Chinese, I think, in, the, in a thousand odd years ago. Um, but although it ends up with a similar sort of result, creating pressure and that side of things, um, it actually has, like I said, about one third of the energy very simple ingredients obviously to make it, but uh, about one third of the energy, th th but actually quite different in how it functions. Um, it explodes. As I said, with the, with the smokeless, it burns. With the black powder, it explodes. When you ignite it, um, a couple of grains explode or whatever the small first part of it explodes, that propagates where that's two goes to eight, goes to 64, goes to 300, it, it grows, um, that's how it explodes, that's how it, how it propagates and creates the pressure, there's explosions. Explosions are, rather than with uh, smokeless transferring heat and pressure, explosions are transferring shock. Now this turns into quite an interesting difference because you would think of oh, explosions, it's going to be more aggressive and sharper and harder and, and at the first instant, in the first quarter of a millisecond, in, they are quite different. Black powder takes off at a sudden rate where it really, its pressure curve is really sort of going straight up. Um, smokeless powder is, it's got to build the pressure to get go. So it sort of takes off more at a, a shallow angle and takes off and ramps up like this. Black powder does the opposite. It takes off sharply and rolls over. And that's because it's transferring shock, which is the explosions. As the pressure builds up, that starts to control the explosions. So it's not quite true, but it's sort of on the lines of its pressure regulating. If you've ever shot a black powder firearm, you'll know that rather than the crack you get out of, or the crack you get out of shooting a smokeless cartridge, a black powder is more of a boom. It's sort of gentler. It's with the proper black powder, you've got smoke coming out the end of it, but it's a real boom. And that's because of this rolling pressure curve. It actually comes up to the point where as it gets some more pressure, it starts to roll over. So it doesn't have the same energy. We've no doubt all seen the, um, the experiments. I've seen it, I'm not gonna do it. I've seen it enough times, but when you just have a line of black powder and you have a line of smokeless powder, um, and you ignite the two and the black powder shoots to the end, straight to the end, and the smokeless powder will very slowly wander on down the line. And um, that is for a very specific reason. Um, the, as I've mentioned just now, the, the pressure is what changes this. 
in atmospheric pressure, the black powder will propagate, will travel as fast as it can get to the next bit. If it's a if it's a open jar full of it, it'll explode the thing because it, it's an explosion. It'll explode right through it instantly. Quite dangerous. Even just an open jar is a very dangerous thing of black powder because of the way it actually burns. Smokeless powder, quite the opposite. With in atmospheric pressure, it's just lazy. It's 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 not inert, but it's almost inert. It'll just very slowly burn because it needs pressure to make it operate. Put it in the cartridge in the firearm and that's when it creates all its energy that's when its potential is really seen and that's where it is a very powerful substance when it's exposed it's far safer than petrol it's safer than than most things you can think of because it really doesn't want to do anything without the pressure um, and it's one of the reasons if we go back into where i suppose a lot of people would know maybe some wouldn't if you go back into where we the black powder was really in vogue um, the, the likes of the cartridges were called, be it the 30-30 or the 40-40 or the 45-70 or the 45-90 or the 45-110, all that sort of stuff in the, in the likes of the Sharps firearms and that sort of stuff. Um, that 45 or whatever that first number was, was the calibre cartridge, the size of the hole in the ball or the size of the, the size of the projectile. And the 70 or 40 or whatever it was, was the amount of black powder, the grains of black powder. Um, and the interesting feature I want to go into is that because of that pressure, that pressure curve, it means that you can use um, simply more, if you've got uh, um, more black powder, if you've got the room to use it, which largely means more barrel, if you've got the room to use it so that pressure curve can, can basically what happens, that pressure comes up to its peak point um, where, the, where the black powder starts to slow down then what you so it starts to slow down in its in its, um, in its propagation rate so it sort of sets at a pressure point as the projectile moves that pressure drops that then it can be more powder the and it sort of can follow the pressure curve can follow the expansion rate as the projectile leaves so you can end up using I think with the likes of the 45 they went up to 140 grains of powder probably getting into 38 inch barrels to make that work not that it's burning all the barrel, but you need the expansion to that combination between the expansion of the chamber or pressure area, as well as using that pressure effectively. I mean, you end up with very long barrels to do that. Um, and I suppose it's one of the, the ingredients that some folk get confused about. And the 4570 is a good one to talk about because I've been there quite a bit. Um, I'm only just starting down the black powder curve but what I can tell you is, and I've seen in the numbers, I can create out of a 20 inch barrel, I can create very, and a 4570, I can create very similar results to what we're seeing out of a 34 inch barrel in a black powder in a 45120. Um, now there's two things going on. One is the, the amount of energy that's in smokeless powder. It's got, like I said, three times the energy. The other thing is the different ways they use their pressure curve. As I've just mentioned, with black powder, it builds up and it gets to a pressure where it backs off. So if you give it more powder and more barrel, and it can then follow this longer, smoother, not as high, but the pressure curve can keep going to get more speed out of the bullet by keeping on going for longer to get more speed out of the bullet. So it just keeps on pushing those explosions forward. Whereas black powder, sorry, whereas smokeless powder has largely, it's gonna reach its peak pressure curve at um, around half a millisecond. The way it does it is it gets the pressure up, the gas, even though that, that peak pressure has been hit, that explosion has happened. What's happening at that stage then is that it's got a lot higher pressure, largely, you know, whereas black powder is probably going to be in the 15,000 PSI, and I don't know how it goes, maybe 20,000 PSI. Smokeless powder will be in the 45, 55, 60,000 PSI, three times the pressure it uses that expanded pressure to push out the barrel. Now, if it's got excised barrel, the likes of 4570 and excised bullet, it can only use that for a certain amount of time before it starts to, the friction of the barrel starts to override the remainder of the pressure. So, and I don't, I haven't done the maths, but you're probably down in the 20 inch barrel is all you're going to use in what that system, that, that the pressure you can get to, you still have a maximum pressure. You know, around 60,000, well, it's not even going to be that with something like lever action, you're back down in the 40,000 or 35,000 PSI is the maximum pressure you can get. So 
even with the strongest, you still find cartridge strengths and that sort of stuff are going to be around the 60,000 PSI is the maximum place you're going to get to in the way of strength that can hold. So it can only got, then it only needs enough barrel to use that pressure efficiently. Go back to our lower pressure, but the black powder side of things, it actually does it differently. It uses this following pressure curve that keeps on going, even though it's not higher pressure, the energy is still happening as the bullet is leaving, so it actually is creating more velocity with the same with with the lower pressure. Hence, and this is the bit where I was trying to get to, hope it wasn't too complicated, but you can have a 36 inch black powder, 45, 130, whatever it is, whatever your big one is, that is that's what it needed to be to get that speed. And you'll probably find back down in the 24 inches or 20 inches, you can create the same sort of speeds with smokeless powder because of an incredibly different way the two systems actually work. Ultimately, they both end up with a very similar job. You know, the, the, the likes of smokeless powder for sure and bottleneck cartridges and that sort of stuff creates a lot, lot more going on on that side of things. I um, mean, it has three times more energy. But you come back into the middle of the road, they ended up with a very similar result, something that was designed literally thousand, at least a thousand years previously, worked so very well. And as I'd say, as I said, a lot of people who use the black powder love it, swear by it, it's addictive sort of thing, the feeling, the smoke, the whole lot, um, and the way it works. And actually that, that following pressure curve does make a lot of sense in a lot of fashions too, versus the quite brutal and aggressive strength of the nitro or the smokeless gunpowder. So listen, I hope that was worth something to people. Um, it certainly, there's a fair bit going on there. Largely stay inside what the manufacturer is recommending. This is stuff to try and make sense of for people. Certainly some of the barrel length things, some of the confusion that people get when you're talking smokeless, firearm smokeless setups versus um, black powder setups, that type of thing. Yes, it can get pretty confusing on that side of things, uh, but it is, um, yeah, listen, it all, like I said, stay inside the brackets of, the, of, the, of what the manufacturers recommend and you won't go wrong. Um, but there is quite a bit to understand this side of things. And that's just the gunpowder side of the internal ballistics. Um, listen, I think that's what I got to tell you today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks very much for checking in and we'll catch you next time.